Hi, I'm Kinkas and I'm a synth DIY guy. I want to talk to you about op amps today. Here's a disclaimer, I'm not an engineer, but I do have a working knowledge of how op amps can be used for some very useful synthesizer circuits. I have an idea of how it works. I hope I don't make any horrible mistakes. My engineer friends will be the first to point out any mistakes that I make, but here we go. This is an integrated circuit containing four op amps in there. It's a quad op amp and it's called the TL074. There's the TL072 that only has two and there's the TL071 that only has one. I like to use this one a lot because it's quite common to need many op amps in a circuit and having four of them in one single chip is very useful. The way the pinout is arranged is the center pins are actually the supply pins. So the top one is the negative voltage supply. So for Eurorack you would use negative 12 volts and on the bottom positive 12 volts. The way the pins are numbered start with the there's a little byte here on the left side of the byte is pin 1 and it goes around the chip. So you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. It's a 14 pin chip and the way it's arranged is very intuitive as well. It's easy to memorize so you can work with it. Aside from pin 4 being the positive rail and pin 11 being the negative rail, the corners are all the op amp outputs. We we'll have our outputs like this. Well an op amp, this is the diagram, the circuit diagram for the op amp. An op amp is a device containing three terminals. Right, they have an inverting input, a non-inverting input, and an output. I'll get to that in a minute, but just so you see how that's laid out on the chip itself. After the outputs, you have the inverting inputs. And after that, you have the non-inverting inputs. And that's symmetrical all around the chip. This is a good representation of how it's all laid out. Each one of these is one op amp. So you have your four op amps on the four corners of the chip and the two pins that are in the middle are your supply pins, okay? Now, a few things to keep in mind with op amps. Normally, you want to use them with bipolar supplies, right? Some op amps work okay with uh, single polar supplies. Usually requires a workaround like creating a virtual ground and I do not recommend it for synth circuits for a couple of reasons. One of them is you have bipolar supplies on all modular synthesizers anyway, so why not use them? The audio waves are bipolar. Any audio wave is actually oscillating around about zero volts as a central reference. So it goes negative and positive, negative and positive. And there's a rule of thumb. Every time you use an op amp, you use a couple of capacitors from the supply pins to ground. Okay, these are called decoupling capacitors and they're usually 100 nanofarad capacitors, also known as 0.1 microfarad capacitors. If you look at capacitor values, you realize that these are the same 100 nanofarads and 0.1 microfarads are the same value. And these capacitors, they should go as close to the supply pins on the actual chip as possible. This is just default for any op amp that you will use most likely. You will try to use bipolar supplies and always use decoupling capacitors from each supply pin to ground and they go very near the supply pins. My friend Roman Sova from Poland, who is an actual electrical engineer and a great synth designer, has reviewed this video and pointed out some things I should correct or clarify. One of them is that although the 100 nanofarads decoupling cap is used in 99% of the circuits you will see, it is only a convention, while the actual optimal value would depend on each circuit and involve some more complex calculations. But for our immediate intents and purposes, 100 nanofarads will do. One mistake to avoid like the plague is to invert the supply pins. You will burn your chip if you do that and you might even explode a few capacitors, destroy your power supply. It's a mess. Don't do it. Okay. So don't even trust me right now. Go to the data sheet for whatever op amp you're using and double, triple, quadruple check which pin is positive supply and which one is negative. Okay. The way I remember 
is that it's counterintuitive. Like I would want the positive to be on top and the negative to be on the bottom. So I know that's the inverse of that. The negative is on the top, considering that the byte is on the left side and the writing on the chip is actually right side up. Okay, so that's enough with the physical device. We're gonna start getting theoretical a little bit here. So here's a big drawing of the op amp. It's not a very equilateral triangle, but it'll have to do. And it has, as I mentioned before, two inputs, a non-inverting input and an inverting input. Please avoid calling them negative and positive. They're not negative and positive. They're non-inverting and inverting inputs and the output, right? Now, the op amp has a reason to exist. It has its raison d'etre, its burning desire is to make sure that these two inputs are the same voltage. And what it'll do is it'll generate a voltage out of its output in order to make sure that that happens. And the way that we direct the output is how this is achieved, right? And here I'll add another parenthesis from Roman. This is only true of circuits containing a negative feedback path, that is a connection from output to inverting input, with or without a resistor in between. When this is not the case, the op amp's reason to exist is actually to amplify as much as it can the differential voltage between those two inputs. So one simple way to illustrate this is with a simple circuit called the voltage follower, also known as the buffer. Right. You might have seen this if you've seen my video on the dead bug buffer, where we build a buffered multi for Eurorack synthesizers. So what we do is we input a voltage into the non-inverting input, and we feed the output back to the inverting input. So what's going to happen is, let's say you put 5 volts right here. The input is going to read these 5 volts, and the op amp is going to realize that it's output is connected to the inverting input so if it generates the same 5 volts here you're gonna have the 5 volts at the inverting input making them equal and that's what it wants so now it's happy okay Roman tells me this would be a good place to mention the input offset voltage a bit of an advanced topic but worth mentioning every op amp has inaccuracies caused by manufacturing randomness and that shows up as the input offset voltage which is basically a voltage you have to add to one of the inputs to make the output go to zero volts without feedback. Something to keep in mind and research further if you go deeper into circuit design. While you're at it, research bias current as well. So this is a basic voltage follower, buffer. Now, why would you do this if you already have 5 volts here? What's the point of using the circuit to get the same 5 volts out here? This is the output and this is the input. The reason you would do this is because the inputs of the op amp are extremely high impedance. So high that it's actually almost infinite. In the case of the TL074, it's 10 to the 12th power ohms. So it's a whole, whole lot of zeros. You can pretty much assume that no current is going through which means that you're not affecting that original 5 volts, the original voltage at all. This is pretty much just a voltage detector. It tells the op amp what the voltage is without actually drawing any current and electrons flowing into the op amp, okay? Now, the output is low impedance, meaning a lot of current can flow out of this without affecting the voltage. So, for example, if you're going to feed a whole bunch of oscillators with the same keyboard like your keyboard is generating octave 5 5 volts and you have three vcos if you connect the 5 volts from the keyboard directly to the vco voltage per octave inputs you might load down this 5 volts and it goes a little bit out of tune but if you put it in here it stays unaffected and you get a nice chunky output that can feed all three vcos without getting loaded down too much now another use for the op amp is to make an amplifier. So if I take an input into the inverting, um, let's call this my input, and I send that through an input resistor, let's call it RI, right, for R input, and I connect the non-inverting input to ground, What's happening? I'm telling the op amp that this input is at zero volts because that's what circuit ground means. And now I give it a feedback 
path with another resistor. We'll call that RFB, feedback resistor. And this is our output right here. So if you send a voltage on the input and uh, the op amp is seeing zero volts here because it's tied to circuit ground, it wants to make these two inputs the same, what is it going to do? If this resistor is the same as this one, then it's going to generate the mirror image or the inverse of the input voltage so that when it hits here, you get zero volts again here. So let's say you put five volts here. The feedback resistor and the input resistor are the same. You will get the same five volts, but inverted. You get minus five volts at the output and you get zero volts over here, which is what the op amp wants. Now, if this value is higher than this one, what's gonna happen? The op amp is gonna be forced to generate a higher voltage than the input voltage. And that's basically how it amplifies, right? And that ratio of amplification is a very simple formula where feedback resistor divided by input resistor multiplied by minus one is your gain, right? So that's an easy way to amplify a signal. If you're using an audio signal, for example, that it doesn't matter that it'll be inverted, like a sine wave that goes up here, it's gonna be coming down here and vice versa. If that doesn't bother you, if it's just an audio signal, then this is enough of an amplifier for your needs and you can adjust the gain by using this formula. So for example, let's say you want a gain of minus 10, right? So if you put one volt here, you will get minus 10 volts at the output. The way you would do that is you can choose 10K for the input resistor and 100K for the feedback resistor, right? And that's going to be multiplied by minus one and that's going to be equal to minus 10. So now you have a gain of minus 10 if you use these values for feedback and input resistor. Now, if you need the phase of the signal to be equal to the input, there are two ways to do that. One of them is to just use a second inverting amplifier. This time we'll make it unity gain. So we'll make the input resistor the same as the feedback resistor. So for example, 10K and 10K. Now all this is doing is not amplifying at all because both resistors are the same. So it's just inverting again. So when you invert the inverted, you're multiplying. If you multiply minus one by minus one, you get one, right? Now the other way that you could get gain without inversion is a different configuration of the op amp where you have the input actually going into the non-inverting input, right? And you have your feedback is always gonna be negative. And now you have a resistor to ground. Now this is the non-inverting amplifier configuration. It's actually the same circuit from the op amp's point of view. You still have the same resistors and the op amp doesn't know that at the non-inverting input, there's now a signal instead of ground. The formula for non-inverting gain is feedback resistor divided by ground resistor plus one, okay? So as an example, let's say we have 10K here and 100K here. Now that's gonna be 100 divided by 10 plus one, which is equal to 10 plus one, which is equal to 11. So you have gain equals 11 if you use these values that I just put in here, right? So even if you use the same value, like 100K here and 100K here, you will not get unity gain if you use this configuration. You get gain of two rather than unity gain. So it's a little bit different formula, but it works if you need an amplifier that will maintain the signal orientation, the sign of the signal. If it's positive, it'll come out positive. If it's negative, it'll come out negative. And you can use this configuration right here. Here, Roman suggests that I point out the advantages of each approach. Basically, in an inverting amplifier, the inputs are held at a steady voltage. In a non-inverting amplifier, the inputs travel all over the place. So an inverting amp will always have less ringing and better phase characteristics. On the other hand, the non-inverting amplifier is only one stage, so there's less chance to add noise and nonlinear distortion, and it's simpler to build. Now, there are a lot of things you can do with an op amp. You can make comparators, you can make filters, LFOs, oscillators, 
but one of the most useful and most common circuits is the mixer. Pretty much any mixer that you see in a modular synthesizer is based on the circuit I'm going to show you right here. So we're going to create three inputs. You can use as many inputs as you want. There's no limit to how many inputs you use. We're going to use a potentiometer as an input attenuator for each one of these inputs. Right? Potentiometer is a variable voltage divider. So it has three terminals. Two terminals are at the extreme ends of a resistor and the third terminal called the wiper wipes between these extremes. So it lets you go from the full signal strength to zero volts, which is ground, if you have the other extremity connected to ground like I have right here. So these are our wipers and the wiper goes into the input resistor like we saw on the inverting amplifier. Let's call these input resistors 100K, okay? Now the fact that there are many doesn't change the formula. We'll sum these into a common node and we'll send this node into the inverting input of the op-amp and we'll create the feedback using the same value resistor as the input resistors so that this is a unity gain mixer. It's not adding any gain, it's not increasing the volume, it's just mixing and doing nothing more than mixing. Don't forget to send the non-inverting input to ground, right, to set this as zero volts potential. And since we want to use this mixer not only for audio but also for LFOs, envelope generators, etc., we do want it to maintain the correct orientation. So if we have an envelope curve going like this, we don't want it to go over here, it'll be going down. We don't want that. So what we'll do is we'll add another unity gain inverting amplifier following the first one only with the only sole purpose of re-inverting or de-inverting however you want to call it the output of the first op amp so it's basically the same exact thing and we can use even the same values you can use 100k here and 100k here and now the sum of the inputs gets buffered and inverted and then re-invert it out here and this is pretty much it. That's how you make a mixer in general. Now it's probably a good idea to put a little resistor on the output here just to protect this op-amp output from shorting to ground which might make it overheat, might not like that. Some people use 100 ohm resistor in this spot. I like to use a 1k resistor in this spot and this is our output. This is our mixed output right here. So yeah, this is a basic DC or AC mixer. The reason it's good for both DC and AC is it doesn't have AC coupling capacitors. That's a story for another day, but if you wanted it to be only an audio mixer and you wanted it to centralize the audio oscillations so that there's no DC offset, you would use capacitors right here before each resistor and maybe a capacitor out here at the output instead of the resistor. But for now, we do want our mixer to be useful for both control voltages and audio signals. So we'll leave it simple like this. It's called DC coupled when it doesn't have capacitors. So on our next video, we're gonna put this in practice. We're actually gonna build a dual mixer with a prototyping kit I got from Otto's lab all the way from Hungary. So that's gonna be fun. I hope you liked this video. If you did like it, subscribe to my channel, maybe join our Patreon. Now, see you soon and stay noisy.